Gainesville or Tallahassee or someplace. And they have to make sure that the course fits in the right description and it's not met by other courses because the state uses the same numbering system throughout the entire state university system. So it's a very long, complicated process in getting it assigned a specific number. And 16930 is a generic number, meaning it's another one of those. So, uh, so that's why they have all the same number. So my fractal and chaos course actually has a real number. It's about 57 something something. So uh, uh, both I and Steve Bressler were in the process of submitting all these to the curriculum committee and getting all this uh, stuff done. So that means that either it was too <coughs> difficult or we didn't get it done or something, something like that happened. So that's why they all have the same number. Okay. Okay. Um, but I know other things too. I don't know if I told last year, did I tell you last year where this thing comes from? I know where that thing comes from. So I can do that later. I won't do that now. But, but so I know lots of odd stuff. Uh, okay, what I want to do now, and, and this, this lecture is going to be very different than the rest of the course, right? Because the rest of the course we're going to do like, you know, skewed distributions and central tendencies and dispersions. So it's going to be very different than this. I'm just doing this to kind of set the stage for how we're using all the other analysis. So um, uh, the third leg is theory. And I want to talk a little bit about theory. Um, I think, um, although it, this is less true in the center, I think certainly in the rest of psychology, people don't understand the roles theory plays. So I want to describe some of the roles I think theory plays, especially being a theoretician. Um, the usual textbook explanation of theory is that um, theory summarizes facts and predicts and explains. So that's the usual um, role of um, of theory. Let me see where we are here. Okay. Um, the, the textbook I used my undergraduate course gives an example of an explanation where they say the theory of gravity explains why apples fall. In fact, this is an interesting textbook because it, it makes a number of comments um, about physics. This is a physics comment. Uh, everything this textbook says about physics is wrong. It's not that some of them are wrong, but absolutely everything is wrong, which is pretty good if you think about it. I mean, it's hard to get everything wrong. And in fact, um, um, the, the, the theory of gravity is formulated by uh, Isaac Newton. In fact, specifically does not explain why apples fall. Uh, and this was a major turning point in the history of science and the history of physics. Um, what happened around this time, there were two competing groups of people that have had ideas about gravity. One were the uh, followers of Descartes. And Descartes wrote under the Latin name of Cartesius. Cartesius so these people are called Cartesians. And that's why they're called Cartesian coordinates. He was into doing graphs and a lot of other things. Um, and these guys, they were in France, and, and they had this really great model for gravity. I mean, it was really good. There were these vortices, these invisible vortices, and they rotated. And then this one would, would sort of make the next one twist, and, and you know, they would cause eventually a force of one thing on, a, on another. And it was a really great, very me mechanistic model, and they had nice woodcuts, and, and you know, very, very visual. Um, and on the other hand, Newton had a very different approach. Newton was able to write down an equation that said that the force on one object was inversely proportional to the distance between the two objects squared and proportional to the masses of each object. And from this, he was able to calculate the motion of the objects, like the planets in the solar system, like the moon. He was also able to compute other things, like the shape of the Earth because the Earth is a little more squashed at the equator because it's rotating. And now uh, Newton could do all these great computations, which turned out to be very accurate. But Newton's theory was very heavily criticized because it said it was a return to medieval mysticism. It was very heavily criticized in, 
because if we have one body here and another body here, how does this one feel the force of the other one? And this one was called, this problem was called action at a distance. And there was no discussion at all in Newton's this as to how this worked. In fact, there was no explanation at all. And in fact, what Newton said in a very famous line in his book, this is not my bad spelling, but this is in Latin. Um, Newton said he was not going to make up a hypothesis about how this worked. That what Newton was going to do was write down a mathematical law and use it to make predictions, and that was going to have meaning. But he wasn't going to make up a story. And in fact, this is a tremendous turning point in the history of science and certainly of physics because it meant we dealt with the equations and not with the qualitative understanding of necessarily what was going on. But if we could write down in the equations and the equations represent something and we can predict from them, then we're happy with that, even if we don't understand how this works. And in fact, um, what happened was uh, eventually, Einstein figured out kind of how this worked, that this, this body changed the space around it, and that change propagated the speed of light and affected the other one. But um, the point was that Newton specifically did not explain gravity. Nothing here explains gravity, even though this represents a physical law, and we can use it to make predictions. So this idea that a theory necessarily explains something is not, um, not necessarily the case. So let me tell you the four things that I think uh, theories do. Um, the first thing that a theory does is that it leads you somewhere new. C can one of you close the door because we're getting just some feedback? Thanks, Toby. And then I won't be tempted to shout as much. Uh, last semester I taught in this room and we uh, broadcast this to another site at Northern Palm Beach and whenever I was talking to people up there I would shout. But it doesn't work that way. I mean the microphone picks it up and uh, shouting doesn't work between here and Northern Palm Beach actually. Uh, so uh, I'll try not to do that. Uh, it, let me give an example of this. Um, a long time ago a very smart scientist uh, named Claudius Ptolemy um, may I put the E in the wrong place, um, had this idea for the solar system where we had the Earth at the center of the universe, which seems reasonable, and uh, everything like the sun and everything went around the Earth. And this seemed to be like a pretty good uh, way of explaining how things happen. And it seems right, because you, you look in the east and the sun rises in the east and moves around the earth and sets in the west. And it seems pretty reasonable, actually. Um, but a bit, little more than a thousand years later, uh, um, a guy named Copernicus, um, whose instruments I saw in uh, Krakow, uh, and um, if I was a little more clever, I could remember the better spelling of his name in Polish, which I can't quite. It's spelled a little. It's like uh, what? It's no. It's with K's. It's first of all, it's with a K. And, yeah. How do you spell it? Like that? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, his idea was that the sun was in the center and the earth went around the sun and the other planets went around the sun. Now, it's really interesting how people came to believe this theory instead of that theory. In fact, none of the things that they tell you about theories uh, and why people believe them were true in how the switch from this theory to that theory happened. In fact, uh, both of these theories make about the same predictions for the positions of the sun and the planets in the sky. And at the beginning, there was no other evidence to suggest that this one or that one uh, were more useful. And there's a story that's told by physicists, which is not true, that this theory required fewer adjustable parameters than this one. 
But in fact, the way Copernicus formulated it, that was not the case. Both of these models had about 40 some odd uh, parameters that were adjusted to fit the data. And um, so they had about the same amount of adjustable parameters. And eventually, people believed in this one partly because it was more beautiful and partly because other things happened. And I think this is very important. But in the history of science, analogy is very important. We don't use analogy much, but analogies are very, very important. Um, when Galileo discovered that uh, Jupiter had four little moons that went in orbit around it, people believe that maybe if moons could orbit Jupiter, then maybe the Earth could orbit the sun. Now, logically, these two have nothing to do with each other. Okay, but somehow people thought of this as a miniature solar system, and maybe we were part of a real solar system. So this was very important. Eventually, people saw other things. For example, the fact that the planet Venus is interior to the sun means that Venus goes through phases like the moon, and those could be seen in the telescope. And that would be true of this model, but not necessarily true of the other model. So eventually, there were physical facts that were true for this model. But at the beginning, they weren't. People just believed in this one because it was more beautiful, because it was nice, and then eventually shifted to this one because it was more beautiful. And this shift is a shift in a word we're going to come to a little bit later called paradigm. Now, you could fit all of the data by this model, and there were crucial things in, this mo in both of these models, which I'm actually not. Maybe I will explain. The crucial thing of the Ptolemaic model was, two, was a hidden, two hidden assumptions. Maybe not so hidden. One, that the Earth is at the center of the universe. And two, that the motions of the planets have to be circles. Why do they have to be circles? Because. Because they're planets and they're in the sky and things in the sky are perfect and circles are perfect. This is a hard, a hard concept for us to understand, but it wasn't hard for these Greeks to understand. They were into that. So for example, if the Earth was at the center and the motion of the planet Mars wasn't right for one circle, maybe Mars was on two circles. So there was a little circle, and maybe that little circle went around the bigger circle. So by adding circles like this, you could get all this model to fit the data. This model will fit all the data. In fact, if you add enough circles, this model will make 100% correct predictions. And yet it's wrong. Okay, why is this model wrong? This model was wrong because it was a dead end, which I used to say is the same as no outlet. But actually, formally, I found out that uh, dead end is different from no outlet. Dead end means that there's only one way to get back to the starting point. No outlet means there can be a branch elsewhere, but there's only one way to get back out. So they mean slightly technically two different things, um, as opposed to braces and suspenders or fiddle and violin, which mean identically the same things, but which are different words. Um, and the reason why the Ptolemaic system, about the uh, Copernican system with the sun at the center and the earth going around it, uh, led somewhere new was that from Copernicus, another guy who was very weird um, uh, named Kepler, so Copernicus put the Earth at the center. Kepler realized that the orbits weren't circles, they were ellipses. And because Kepler realized they were ellipses, the guy I mentioned before, Newton, could show that an ellipse would represent the force that was 1 over r squared. And Einstein could figure out how one body influenced another by the field or the space that connected them. So Copernicus's theory led somewhere, and the Ptolemaic theory didn't. Even though both made the same predictions, and they had the same number of adjustable parameters. And I think this is very important to understand, that theories are not true or important just because they fit data. It's nice they fit the data, but people are too focused on that. Theory is good when it leads to new understanding. And we can have many wrong theories that fit data, especially if we add adjustable parameters. And the real usefulness of a theory is to lead to some new set of knowledge that's useful. And that's what Copernicus's theory did and what um, Ptolemy's theory didn't do. 
So that's the first role of theory, is that it starts us on the right thread, on the right track. When does the theory do that? How do we know when that's the case? Well, we don't know a priori. It would be no. So we have to see how things work out. But uh, the theory is not just putting data and making predictions. Because I've given you an example of a theory that's 100% wrong, that fits all the data and can make accurate quantitative predictions. But it was a failure in not catching the right physics of the problem and not leading us to a useful place. Okay, so that's the first role of theory is to lead someplace new. Second role of theory, and this is very hard, and I've got to state this very carefully so you don't get the wrong impression. That theories, not experiments, theories alone can prove things true. Now, I need to say a lot about this. I said at the very beginning that in science we ask nature, we don't tell her. So that means in the long run, if the theory is contradicted by real hard experimental data, then we throw away the theory. Okay. But, so in the longest run, we need to have some experimental confirmation. But sometimes we look at a theory and it provides so much understanding that we know it has to be true. This happened starting about 120 years ago, where, I'm going to need this, we call this a prop. Uh, but um, um, about 120 years ago, people started to study electricity and magnetism. And it was really weird because when you had moving electricity, it made magnetism. When you had moving magnetism, it made electricity. So people knew they were related in some way, but they couldn't figure out how. So if you switch to the camera, because I'm going to need to use my prop here, thanks. Um, eventually, what Einstein showed was that there was something which he called the electromagnetic tensor. And the electromagnetic tensor was this thing like this board eraser. And that sometimes when you looked at things in a certain way, you see the end of the board eraser, it looks small. But sometimes when you look at things, the board eraser in a different way, it looks broader, it looks big. So even though we see different aspects of this thing, we know it's one thing. What Einstein was able to show in the theory of special relativity is that when we looked at things in different ways, which in special relativity means at different velocities, and that sometimes we saw electricity, electricity, and sometimes we saw magnetism, but there was only one thing, which was this electromagnetic thing. Now, this theory of, of Einstein called special relativity was so wonderful that it suddenly made clear what people had no understanding of for 50 years, that people believed it was true for that reason. Because it made these connections between electricity and magnetism so clear. If you can go back to the Elmo, one of the things that came out of this theory of special relativity was this thing, equals mc squared. Now, this comes out of a logical consequence of Einstein's linking electricity and magnetism. It wasn't that Einstein made this hypothesis and then did measurements of energy and did measurements of mass and the speed of light and found that they were equal, right? None of this happened. This derived out of this relationship between electricity and magnetism. People believed this was true because it had so much power in explaining the connection between electricity and magnetism. People believe theories are true when they carry so much weight. Now, if this had turned out experimentally in the long run not to have been verified, again, it, we would not believe this. But I think this is very important to realize that just the power of the explanation of a theory in linking unrelated things can be useful enough to show us that certain things are true. And I don't think people who do experiments have a good understanding of this. That when the theory is so clear and relates things so clearly uh, that um, 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 that then we can believe things are true. So that's the second purpose of theory. Third purpose of theory, which is labeled four here, um, is theories allow us to reach conclusions. In the lecture I'm going to give actually on Monday, uh, but not here, um, We use numbers in science. By conclusions, we use numbers in science 
only to reach qualitative conclusions, never quantitative conclusions. What does that oxymoron mean? That sounds like a very strange statement. The purpose of numbers in science is not to use numbers. It's to reach meaning in the same way that the philosophers reached meaning in the forest with the trees. So for example, if I tell you, uh, uh, or let me ask you, does anyone have any idea what the average, den oh, I mean, I did let me just tell you. The average density of the sun is about 1.4 grams per cc. It's pretty light. What this number tells us is that whatever the sun is, it can't be a burning ball of coal, because the average density of coal is three. And it can't be a red hot ball of iron, because the average density of iron is six. So just from the density of the sun, we've learned something qualitative about the sun. Now, it's not so unreasonable to think that the sun is made out of coal, because if you look at the spectra of the sun, you see carbon. And if you look at the spectra of the sun, you also see iron. In fact, what you don't see in the spectra of the sun is hydrogen, which is what the sun is made out of. And maybe not now I'll tell the story of how we know the sun is made out of hydrogen when we don't see it. But uh, what this says is knowing the density tells us whatever the sun is, it's not coal or iron. And um, this is how we've used a number to tell us something. It doesn't matter that the number is actually closer to that because that doesn't tell us anything additional. So why we use numbers is what they tell us about a system, not for the numerical value of the number itself. And I think sometimes this gets lost in how people handle science sometimes, that the numbers are useful if they lead us to some understanding. But just having the numbers to more decimal places if it doesn't give us any understanding is not helpful to us. So I want to emphasize that, that in this case, I've used um, some aspects of theory. And here, it's a very simple one, mass divided by volume. In order to understand the sun is made out of hydrogen, it turns out that the carbon and iron we see in the spectra of the sun are ionized. They're missing electrons. And when you start to count up the electrons, which an Indian physicist named Saha did, he realized there's a lot of extra electrons. And if you think about it, we realize the only place the electrons could come from in that ratio is from hydrogen. So we know the sun is made out of hydrogen because we see carbon and ion. And because of the ionization state of that tells us the elect extra electrons really have come from hydrogen or have been knocked off from hydrogen. So here we use the theory to find that what we see is not what we get, that we need the theory to look at the data and understand what's there. And just because we see coal and iron doesn't mean the sun is made out of coal and iron. So here we've used the theory in terms of calculating the average density, in terms of calculating the electrons to tell what the sun is really made out of. And the fourth uh, role of theory, which is labeled three in my notes, is that theory provides a set of possibilities. Now, what we do is we look at the world and we see things that are there. And if we have different possibilities of what to look for, then we can find different things. If the only tool we have is a hammer, then we tend to treat everything as if it were a nail. So by having different possibilities, we can then know what to look for. And for example, Kelso has done this in terms of Hawkins' paradigm in looking for bifurcations in sensory and motor systems. And if we know such a thing as a bifurcation exists, we can look for it and maybe find it. But if we didn't know about it, we'd never think of looking for it. So theories have these four roles of um, First of all, leading somewhere new. Uh, second of all, proving things are true. Thirdly, reaching qualitative conclusions. And fourth, providing a dictionary of possibilities. Now, notice nowhere in this list, if I bless you, nowhere in this list have I said anything about making predictions or, or testing hypotheses or anything like that, although theories can also be useful in that way. But to me, these are the most essential aspects of, of what theories are. Now, let me go back 
again to this concept that I said I would return to about paradigms. Let me talk a little bit about paradigms. Um, I don't think I did this in, in the fract. Did I do this in the fractal and chaos course? Did we do this? Well, let, let's do this exercise. What I'd like you to do is read the sentence in the enclosed box and um, then re count the number of Fs in, the, in this sentence. So the instructions say here, read you the instructions, count the Fs in the sentence. Count them only once and do not go back and count them again. So why don't each of you read this sentence to yourself and write down on a piece of paper in front of you the number of Fs in this sentence. Okay, how many, how many Fs are in this sentence? Six. How many do you have? Three. You have three, six, Any, anyone else? Five. Five? Okay, anyone else? Three. How many? Three. Three, okay, we got three. You see, this seems like a really, really simple problem, right? I've given you a very well-defined thing. This is a pattern identification problem that you should, all should be pretty good at doing, right? And yet it's hard. The reason why this is a very, very hard problem is that, again, it goes back to if the only tool is a hammer, you tend to treat everything as if it were a nail, or we make our tools, and thereafter our tools uh, make us and uh, shape us. And the, the problem here is we, we're so used to seeing things in context that we can't see them anymore. And we'll see that's the same problem in analyzing data. And we'll see that's the problem in not realizing that sometimes the data is non-Gaussian or doesn't have the properties that we're used to seeing that you've had in some of your statistics courses. That actually seeing stuff is really hard because we always see things in a context. And when things, we try to really see them, instead of seeing in the concept, we can't do it. And this context is what um, this philosopher of science, uh, um, uh, Kuhn, uh, called a paradigm, which is a way of looking at something. And that's why it's hard to see how many Fs there are here, because we're used to seeing it in a context. Now, let me give you a general rule, which I mentioned in the Fractal and Chaos course last, last year, which is that very often, if we're presented with a hard problem, the way to deal with it is not to work at it, because it's too hard, but what you do is turn it into an easy problem and solve the easy problem. And that's a good approach to solving a lot of problems. So although this is very hard to do, if I change the problem by crossing out every F that I find, then it will turn out to be a lot easier. So let me do that. Let's, let me now count the number of Fs by doing this. One, two, three, four, five, six. See how easy that was? So the point here is that very often by changing the approach, we turn a hard problem into an easy problem. Now, I, I've done this in a number of different cases where we've had algorithms that I could make run thousands of times faster on the computer by starting at a different point, in, instead of changing things from floating point to integer and hoping a little bit. If you have a really hard problem, the way to deal with it is not to change it a little bit, but to start from the beginning and change it a lot to an identical problem that's easier to solve. And this, which is crossing out, is much easier to deal with. So the point of all this is that here you are. You're going to learn how the brain works with 100 billion brain cells, right, and millions of years of evolution. And how are you going to do that? You can't even see the Fs here. And yet you're going to figure out, right, how this whole brain thing is going to work. <laughs> so the, the, the point of this is that these paradigms allow us to see things and prevent us from seeing things. And this was the point that uh, Kuhn made. So let me discuss, and I think Kuhn's ideas are very important in, in how, what's really going on in science. So I wanted to spend just a few moments discussing them. So his name is Thomas Kuhn. And at least the two books of his that, that I have, that I've uh, read actually, uh, are called The, the uh, Structure of scientific revolutions. Normally, normally I have this 
problem at the beginning that I don't have enough room on blackboards or things on the right of papers, but it usually doesn't happen. Uh, it hasn't happened so far, but it happened just now. Uh, and the Copernican Revolution, which discusses the changeover from the Ptolemaic to the Copernican system that I was referring to before. And the word that he used to describe how we do something in science is paradigm. And the meaning of paradigm is not exactly clear to me, but it's, it's a term that's used to handle certain um, ways of things in grammar. So example, uh, the form, my dictionary says boy, boys, boys, is an example of the paradigm of different forms of the word, um, word boy. Um, and the paradigm be, are so deep and used so often that, very, that usually it's hard to see the assumptions that are actually being used and hard to break out of them. And we'll see this in this course in terms of, of um, what I'm going to try to do is to make very clear what the paradigm is um, in statistics and when it applies and when it doesn't. So we're going to try very hard to deal with aspects of the assumptions that are maybe mentioned but never emphasized in the other statistical course that you've had. And that's what I'm going to try to do here that's a little bit, um, a little bit different. Now, what Kuhn says in this book is that most of science consists of what he calls normal science. I guess this is opposed to weird science. But um, uh, normal science is, first of all, let's put normal science in a sharper focus. Uh, normal science is, for example, in, in this um, system where we have the Earth at the center and the sun going around. If this doesn't fit the data, oh, well, m maybe we'll add another circle. And, you know, we keep, we keep interpreting things in terms of the paradigm. Um, but eventually, there comes to what Noom Kuhn calls a crisis. And in the crisis, we may then actually have a change of paradigm. And in this case, the change in the paradigm was from having the Earth at the center of the solar system to having the sun at the center of the solar system. And why paradigms change is a very difficult thing to understand. And when they change and when they don't change is kind of a very interesting issue. In terms of psychology, examples of paradigms might be behavioralism or the argument of nature versus nature or psychoanalysis or uh, conscious versus unconscious or, or even in terms of bifurcations or in terms of complex systems or connectionist models. And each of these can approach the same material in different ways. And when we, when we play normal science and when we should play with the paradigm are very unclear issues. When do we throw away everything and start from the beginning? And when do we tinker a little bit? And in a very nice article in a letter to the editor in Physics Today a number of years ago, um, someone basically makes the point that we have no idea when we should do that. That is, when do we want to add another parameter and things are basically OK? And when do we want to start from scratch is a very difficult thing to figure out. So when we start dealing with changes in paradigm or when we should is, is a, very, um, a very difficult, um, difficult issue to, um, to deal with. Now, a lot of scientists uh, don't like this paradigm stuff at all. And the typical scientists that don't like it are the scientists who usually have better posture than I have, who know they're doing very important work. And everything is very important that they're doing. So how could it be that there are these paradigms? Because the paradigm implies that we're not making progress in science. The paradigm implies, uh, thanks, the paradigm implies that sometimes we're doing this idea and sometimes that idea and we're not necessarily making progress. And it also says that maybe the paradigm we're working with is going to be thrown away. 
And how could it be thrown away? Because I know I'm doing the good stuff, right? And I have these experiments and data. A lot of scientists are very upset with this idea that Kuhn proposed of the paradigms, even though I think it's obviously true and obviously important. Um, and we're, we're going to see here in terms of the statistics that there has been a paradigm which dominates all the statistics courses. And what I'm going to try to show you here is when some of those, is, first of all, sh show you or try to make clear to you some of those hidden assumptions that are really there that you haven't been emphasized to you. And second of all, I'm going to show you when they're false and they're not true. And what I think is going to happen over the next 10 or 20 years is that this sort of paradigm, the standard statistics, is going to fall or at least change radically. And it's going to be incorporated with these new ideas from fractals and chaos. And we're going to have a much broader picture of how data is and how to analyze data. And I think we're going to see a really dramatic change. Now, this is very hard to convince people or to tell people because statistics seems like it's such a dead field and everything is sort of determined, but it's not. Statistics has been a very lively field over the last 200 years. Most of the, the elementary statistics we know about goes back about 200 years. And most of the more complex things like A novers and students T tests goes back 80 years. Okay, so people and um, a number of people developing this. So statistics is not dead at all. It's actually very alive. And I think we're going to see dramatic changes. And, and my purpose in, in teaching this course is to try to give you a sense of what those changes are and, and what they're going to imply for how we handle data. So that's half of what this course will be. And the other half, although not necessarily equally weighted, is to try to bring everybody up so they can do t-tests and ANOVAs, which of course I never do, but uh, I can at least tell you how to, how to do um, ANOVAs. So as I said, what I wanted to do, I thought it would be useful to start off just to sort of set an overview of what science, I think, is. Um, because this will be a course in how to use methods of science. We'll go back at another time to discuss in a very psychologically orientation how we interpret main effects and, and, and a crossover effects, which are used terms used in psychology. So we'll do one lesson on that on, and on controls as well, um, because this is methods in complex systems. Uh, so I'm going to do that. But most of this course will involve the details and the mechanics of calculating moments and handling distributions. But I wanted to set a very wide, a wide stage for this. Um, so if, if anyone has any other views of science or wants, wants to say anything else, now's a good, a good time to say that. Does anyone have any other questions about the course or the textbooks or, or anything? Not about anything. But. Um, do you know if they have the textbook at Booksmart? Um, I don't know. Uh, normally, I would have checked. I don't know. They should because um, uh, um, it was required. And they usually stock books that are required but not recommended. So my book they would probably not have, but they should have um, the textbook. Um, and if, if they really don't have it, it's the sort of book that sometimes is available at Borders or Barnes and Noble. But I just haven't had the time to check in the bookstore here or, or around, so I just don't know. Do, do, do people know if, the, if, the, if Spiegel's book is in the bookstore here? Does anyone know if that's? But you're all going to find out soon because you're going to read chapters two through four for, uh, in fact, let me make sure two to four is the right. Uh, uh, Oh, yes, those are wonderful chapters. <laughs> are there any, uh, are there any other questions? I, I think the textbook is actually excellent. I think this is the best book on probability and statistics. Um, it doesn't seem fancy because it's not in a textbook form, and it tends to concentrate on more elementary things. But I think its workup of descriptions of the material uh, as well as the worked exercise are really excellent. So I, I think this is really an excellent book. And I have the first edition, which is very worn, and I use it all the time. And I also find it useful because of the work problems. You can put the numbers in and test out a computer program you're using. So if you put the numbers in and you get the wrong mean and the wrong variance or the wrong t value or the wrong ANOVA uh, F ratios, then you know that you're not using a computer program right. Um, so I think it's also very useful to, uh, to have sets of numbers with worked examples so you know when you're using a computer program. 
And I have found computer programs that produce the wrong p-values because I know how to calculate. Uh, it's usually non-parametric tests, and there are shortcuts to doing the non-parametric p-values. Um, but I know the right way to do them, and sometimes they use these asymptotic formulas, which are inappropriate when the data is small, which is exactly the situation when you have a non-parametric test. <coughs> so occasionally I found programs which calculate the wrong p-values. So I don't trust any of these programs. I always, I always uh, test them. Okay, so uh, we're done with this. You should read, uh, read that. And what we're going to do next time, uh, assuming my throat comes back, is we're going to have, I'm going to describe about distributions of data and how we can characterize them by uh, central tendency and dispersions. Okay.